So today we're going to again we're, gonna, we're, we're continuing our discussion on now actually how to start executing queries. So this is what I showed a few few lectures ago, just the overview of uh, what a hypothetical database system would look like, a high performance modern database system. And so we've covered uh, you know some of the parts down here and the networking layer, and now we're we're at this point here, and we're going to start going up in this direction. We're going to start you know talk about execution, uh, query execution today. Next week we'll talk about compilation. Then we'll come back and do more query execution, and then uh, after the midterm or after the, the, the spring break, we'll then talk about uh, query optimization, query planning. Okay. So the idea, of what we're going to talk about today is, and going forward for the rest of the semester, is how to do a uh, you build an efficient query execution engine. Uh, and we're going to differ this between some of the techniques we talked about in a disk-oriented system, because if we're entirely in memory. Uh, then we don't have to worry about the main bottleneck that the disk-oriented system had to worry about. Right? In, in a disk-oriented system, the, the goal was always to reduce disk I.O. Because that was always the most expensive thing. Um, and so now, if we don't have stalls because we're going to fetch disk to run our queries, now we have a bunch of other things we've got to worry about. And those are the, those are the, the, the bottlenecks we'll discuss uh, through the rest of the semester. And then the techniques I'll be describing will show you how to actually overcome them or mitigate their effects on, on the performance of the system. And so the, we obviously still need disk for logging, so that doesn't go away. But it's really like for, when I execute a query, I can assume that I'm going to read a, a tuple or read a column, read a, read a block of data, and that's in memory. All right? So at, the way to essentially think about what we're talking about here is it's going to be, there's not going to be one technique we're going to do that's going to be, just make everything go better. It's going to be sort of a co an orchestration uh, or a co coordination across multiple optimizations. And the, the, by combining them together, then we'll get the efficient execution performance that, that we need. So the spoiler would be, just a, a, the, as a heads up, compilation, parallelization, and vectorization. Those are going to be the big three. But there's a, there's a penalty of other things we can talk about as we go along. So what are our optimization goals in our system? So if the disk goes away. What do we actually want to care about now to get our uh, query execution performance to, 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 be, to be good? So the, the first one is the most obvious, right? We are going to be, uh, we want to just reduce the amount of work we do when we execute queries. And we can do this by reducing the execution count uh, uh, that the data system will execute in order to, to process the query. So we want to execute fewer instructions to do the same amount of work, uh, and that's, you know, then we'll get better performance that way. Right? So the compiler will help us a little bit. Like we can pass in O2. You typically don't ship database systems with O3 uh, compiled compile binaries because that, it's, it's, it's not, that a bit, not that it's experimental. It just There might be some anomalies that you may not be, uh, uh, be, be prepared for or can consider. O2 is typically what people ship software with. Um, so the compiler is going to help a little bit, but what we're going to end up wanting to do is, is specialize our database system for the specific queries that we're executing. Again, that'll be query compilation on Monday next week, but we'll see a flavor of what it looks like today. The next one is to reduce the cycles we have to uh, c incur when we execute uh, these instructions. So we've already done this. We've already re reduced our instruction count. And so for the remaining instructions we do have to execute, we want to reduce the number of cycles it takes to, to process them. Does anybody know how we actually want to do that? Yes? Can you do some sort of parallelization? She said parallelization. Uh, not quite. So that's the same thing as, well, that's vectorization, that's parallelization. But SIMD mm, will give us this. Uh, it won't necessarily give us this. Like, write our code in a way such that, like, I know, like, processors can, like, do, like, branch prediction better, so, like, stuff like that. Yeah, so branch, branch miss prediction is one. Uh, but also cat, reducing the number of cache misses, right? We, if we have an instruction that needs to touch a piece of data, and that piece of data is not in our CPU caches, it has to stall and, and spend, burn more cycles to go out to DRAM to bring it into our CPU caches. So we want to maximize the locality of the data as we're processing them, as well as being uh, intelligent about how we do our, uh, how, how we have branches in the for loops as we process tuples 
to reduce the, the amount of misprediction. And then the last one is sort of what you guys, you two said here, the parallelization and the vectorization. This is just going to allow us to now use the additional cores that we're getting on our, on our CPUs uh, to, to process queries in parallel, right? And we'll talk about what those different schemes look like today. Right? Moore's law is, is essentially ending. But Intel really can't crank up the clock speed anymore without releasing the system. Um, there are alternative uh, materials we could use to build our processors, graphene, that don't have that, that melting point, but we're, that's way, way in the future. So what Intel and AMD are giving us is just more cores. And so we want to execute our queries on, on as many cores as possible. And that's going to be tricky because now we need to potentially coordinate across them. So the paper I had you guys read um, was a bit more, I'm going to say, analytical than what we'll talk about today. But it was, what I, the reason why I picked it is because, at least in the introduction portion of the paper, they went through a lot of the techniques that we'll talk about today um, and just showing you that there's a bunch of different things you could do to, you know, to how, how to design the system to execute queries. And that was focused on OLAP, and that'll primarily be what we'll focus on uh, for today's lecture. But again, they talked about this difference between should I do an index probe, which is random I.O., or should I do a sequential scan? And there's no one answer to say when you want to use one versus the other. The main thing, though, I want to get you, you to get out of it was that typically in a disk system, it was always the, uh, it would always make this uh, decision about whether to do an index scan or a sequential scan based on the selectivity of the predicate. If I have an index and I have a predicate that could be used on the index, how many tuples do I think I'm going to get back from the index? In an in in-memory world, we actually need to care about what the performance of the harbor is going to look like, right? what the CPU will actually do when they, we execute our database system, as well as what other queries are running at the same time. And this one's a bit tricky, because this one needs to be, you know, now we need to have the optimizer be aware of what else is running at the same time, uh, and then you know, make decisions based on that. So typically you only see this, applying this technique in the high-end commercial database systems. Like I don't, Postgres doesn't look to see what other queries are running at the same time. Because it's hard to do this, right? Because it's like, here's my query, I run through the optimizer, I'm gonna pick up what other queries could be running at the same time. By the time my query comes out of the optimizer and starts running, those other queries might be wrong, so my decisions might be incorrect. So this one is hard to do. This one you, you, can, you can compute in the beginning, although it can vary if you're running on Amazon, because you know, the, even though you get the same instance type, the performance can change by, I think, about up to like 20%, because again, somebody else might be running on the same box as you, right? So the type of optimizations we're gonna apply that they talked about in that paper, as well as some additional ones we'll talk about today, are just how we're gonna actually process the query, how we're gonna move data, from one operator to the next, or whether we're gonna do a push or a pull. Scan sharing is a technique where you allow uh, two, two or more queries that are running at the same time for accessing the same data to piggyback off the iterators. And instead of having each of them read the same data at the same time, you combine it together. Materialized views is a way to pre-compute some portion of a query ahead of time and can maintain it as the table gets updated. So you can use that for query execution. So for these two, we're not gonna talk about uh, much this semester. I'll, I'll try to talk about it a little bit later on. Um, but it's these other ones here that we'll, we'll spend most of our time, because as I said, these three here are when you get the, the biggest bang for the buck across most workloads. Obviously, in some cases, materialized views and scan sharing could be very beneficial if you have uh, queries that have high opportunities to take advantage of these things. But typically, these things are, are general purpose enough for what we wanna do. Again, query compilation is, is code specialization. Vectorization, what he talked about, using simple instructions, parallel algorithms, which she, she mentioned is running the operator in parallel. And then we'll finish up the end of the sir, uh, talking about how to embed or uh, how people use yes or user defined functions in queries. And there's big opportunities to actually uh, to basically merge these into the query plan itself instead of treating as the UDF as a black box, and you get way better performance uh, uh, as well. So we'll that, that'll be at the end of the semester. The, again, these are the big, the big three we want, to, we want to discuss. All right, so today's agenda is that we're going to first talk about what uh, sort of modern CPUs look like in the context of database systems, like what aspects of databases, what aspects of CPUs do we need to care about when we build our database system. Then we'll talk about different processing models, so how to move data between, between operators, and then we'll finish up with talking about different uh, parallel execution models. The idea here is basically how we're going to architect the system to support parallel execution of multiple operators at the same time, all right? All right, so this, there was this paper over 50 
15 years old uh, in 2005, um, proposing a improved version of MonadaDB, which is one of the original open source academic column store systems, or in, in, in memory column store systems. It was an improved version of MonadaDB uh, where they showed how existing database system implementations were insufficient or not targeting what modern superscalar CPUs look like, uh, and that if you redesign the architecture of the database system, uh, you can get much better performance if you write it in such a way that is, is ideal or amenable to how the CPU actually processes instructions. So the way to think about this is most times when people build database systems, uh, it, it, certainly, you know, that's common now, but in 2005, this is very common in this paper, they looked like MySQL and Postgres and showed, and Oracle showed this was the case. A lot of times when people build software, they build it in such a way that makes it easier for humans to reason about that software, or what the actual code is actually doing. But it turns out the way that's easier for humans is actually bad for what CPUs actually want. And so what they're proposing here is if you design the system in such a way that may be more complicated for mere mortal humans to reason about, but it's actually better than for the CPU, you're gonna get much, much better performance. So MonadaDB X100 was the name of their prototype. This later got uh, uh, renamed and, and, and commercialized as Vectorwise. And then Actian, uh, which is, is a holding company for old software, they bought uh, Vectorwise, renamed it to a Vector. Um, they then like killed it off for a couple years, or they, they hit, hit it on the web page. And then every time I taught this class, it would, I would always say, oh, Vectorwise is great, too bad Actian killed it off. And then like some dude emailed me last year or two years ago and said, hey, no, no, it's, it's still around. Here's the web page where it actually was. Like they, like the website went out of its way to hide where you could actually download the software. It was really bizarre. Um, but then they sort of came out and rebranded it now as Avalanche, but they're selling this as like a, as an OLAP, in-memory OLAP cloud system in the, uh, or it, it, that runs in, you know, AWS or Azure. So, uh, previous years I had this paper. Um, the first part's really good. The second part is not so much. And it, it's a bit dated, right? It's 15 years ago. So they spent a lot of time talking about like Itanium CPUs, which don't exist anymore. Um, and they talk about how, uh, you know, on Pentium 4s, they long pipelines with like 31 stages. But obviously in, in modern CPUs, the stages are much smaller. Like on, like as of like 2015 or when Haswell and Broadwell uh, came out, it was like 14 stages. Even up the latest one, like uh, Copper Lake from Intel is like, I think 19 stages. Or no, Copper Lake is 14 stages. The AMD Ryzen is 19 stages. So building your system in such a way to deal with these really long pipelines and the way they describe is not, it still matters, but not to the same extent that they, they did back before. And the other reason why this paper is also super interesting is that uh, both Peter Bontz and Marcin Zorkowski, Peter Bontz went back to CWI and he's working on DuckDB now. Marcin basically went off, went off and co-founded Snowflake. And a lot of Snowflake's design is based on the, what, what, how Vectorwise laid out the system, right? So, that, so it, it is, although Vectorwise is not that well known, certainly Snowflake is, is, is super well known now. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the, the rightful successor of, of Vectorwise. All right, so this is gonna be a crash course on, in two slides of like everything you need, you need to know about CPUs that matter for, for databases, right? So, as I said, a CPU is, is, uh, is going to execute instructions in terms of these pipeline stages, right? And the, uh, as I said, the Intel CPUs have 14 pipelines, or 14 stages, and the AMD has, has 19, right? So they're not in the hundreds. Uh, it's, it's pretty short. But the, and the idea is of these pipelines is that it's going to allow the CPU to try to be busy at all times by executing multiple instructions at the same time in its pipeline on different parts of the CPU. So that way, if one instruction is, is, has a cache minute and has to go out to DRAM to get some data that needs to process, at that same cycle, the CPU can execute an instruction that maybe has data already in the registers that it can execute uh, efficiently. So it's going to allow us to execute, um, to, to hide all the delays from, from, these, from these cache misses, and, uh, but it's, and it's going to do this by executing the, the instructions out of the order in which they were inserted into the pipeline. So what that means is like when you write your code, the compiler turns it into CPU instructions, the machine code, it processes that stream of instructions and loads them to the pipeline. The CPU may not actually execute them in the same order that they were defined in that stream. And that is 
They're going to track unreal things like dependencies to know that if the output of one instruction is used as the input for the next instruction, it has to make sure it executes in the, in the correct order. So the, again, these are called super, super scalar CPUs. Uh, and so because we, we are aware of what the hardware is actually going to do, we're going to try to now build our database system execution engine where we actually process tuples, because that's the most expensive part, in such a way to, to mitigate problems that can occur when there's mistakes in visions that the, that the hardware is going to make. So the first problem is going to be dependencies. And this is why I said, like, if you have an instruction that, that the input of that instruction depends on the output of another instruction, the CPU can't execute the second one first. It has to wait till the first one finishes before it executes the next one. So there really isn't that much we can do in our database system to avoid this. Uh, right? When you think about it, like, if, you know, if I need to go scan a tuple and the output of that uh, tuple is then fed and put into a, a buffer. I can't put that data into the buffer until I actually do that scan on the tuple. Right, so again, we, there's not that much we can do to, 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 to avoid this problem. The one that we are going to try to avoid is, is when we have branch mispredictions. So in addition to executing instructions, and in, in, part of executing in, in, you know, multiple instructions in a, sing, in a single cycle, when it sees a jump statement, rat, like to jump to a branch based on some conditional, Rather than waiting to see what that conditional actually evaluates to and then determine whether you go you know, inside the if clause or go, go around it, it will actually try to predict what, what path you're going to take and start executing those instructions that, that are followed in that, in that conditional. And then if it gets it wrong, then it has to throw, back, throw away everything it's already done and then go back and refill the pipeline with the correct path that it should have gone down. If it gets it right, then this is fantastic, right? We, we basically did speculative execution and assumed that you know, we were going to go down this branch and we got it right and all the work we did ahead of time is actually useful for us, right? And again, this is allows us to reduce the number of cycles it takes to, as we process queries. So how the CPU actually does branch mid prediction, from our perspective, if people build in the database system, we don't know, we don't care, and actually, unless you're like, working at Intel or AMD, you're also not going to know because this is like one of the most secretive parts of the database system, or, or sorry, of, of the CPU, right? The, the simplest thing you can think of is like, if you recognize you see a, a, a branch and you've been down that branch before, you just take the path that the last time you ever took, right? That's the easiest, dumbest thing to do. But obviously in, in these, in, in Intel and AMD, AMD, they're doing way more complicated things. And what they're actually doing is, is, is a trade secret, right? But we don't care what it actually is. We, just, we know that there is something that's doing branch prediction and we, we can design our code around it. Yes? Has this been like, heavily impacted by, um, I forget what the bug was, but there was like the thing you could kind of, like, use the branch prediction times. But yeah, so his question is, like, is this part of the problem people were hitting with like, the, the Spectre or the Meltdown stuff? Yes, this is part of it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. OK. So, as I said, because we have long pipelines, the CPU is going to start executing uh, speculative branches for us. And again, the reason why we, need, we want to do this is because it's going to hide the stalls to take uh, dependencies. We, are, we think we're going to execute this. We'll go, let's go ahead and see. And if I get it, then things are fantastic. And that'll reduce my cycle count per instruction. So where we're going to hit this the most is for analytical queries is as we start scanning tuples, we have to evaluate predicates in our where clause to decide whether to put something in our buffer right, to, as, as, as the output for this operator. And that's just an if clause, right? So now if I have a billion tuples in my table and I'm doing a complete sequential scan on that table, I'm going to have uh, uh, a billion branches I have to protect, potentially predict on in my CPU. And now when you think about it too, unless I'm pre-sorting my data like Vertica, the data could be completely random as I do my, my predicate, uh, for, for, you know, for, for, or my attributes when I'm doing my predicate evaluation. So, the, the CPU is, is ha have no way to actually predict what branch you're actually going to take because the, the probability that you're going to take the same branch uh, as you did the last time depends on what the data actually looks like and the selectivity of your predicate. So in, uh, in modern C++, you can actually, uh, so we'll see in the next slide how to design our data system to, to avoid this. Um, in C++ 20, you can and pass a, a hint to the compiler called likely and unlikely when you have like an if clause or a, a case statement where you can say that I'm not likely to go down this branch or I, I am likely to go down this branch. So you could imagine if you're doing cogen, which again we'll talk about it on Monday, you could start inserting these things if you know your predicate 
is not going to be selective, uh, and therefore most tuples are, are not going get to you know, get satisfy the predicate and put in the output buffer. You could inject these things to give hints to the CPU and say this is not going to happen. But even then, the CPU actually can do a pretty good job in that case. If, if you're not very selective at all, it can still do really well. Just some, this, this came up with project, uh, project one. Somebody was asking about this, about branch mix predictions. I just want to say there's, there's a way to do this in C++20 to make this happen. I think modern GCC and uh, uh, there's a it, intrinsic to make this happen. And modern, C, modern GCC and Clang, they don't have the exact keyword, but you can force it to do this as well. All right. So let's look at an example. Yeah, sorry. Uh, what does the compiler do in this case? Compiler then, I think, gives, there's an instruction, I think, in x86 to tell before the conditional in the actual assembly or, or, or the instruction stream to say, like, I'm not, gonna go, I'm not likely to go down this path. But it's a hint, right? All I said was likely. I'm not saying, like, with some probability. The CPU may or may not take that into consideration. And what it actually does when it sees this hint, whoosh, only Intel knows. Right. All right. So let's say we can get select query this uh, when we have two predicates, where key greater than or equal to some low value and key less than or equal to some high value. So normally I tell my PhD students don't show code in slides, but for this for this example we have to see some code. But it, it should be pretty simple to to understand. So a really simple way to implement this that that select query is just a for loop on every single tuple on the table. Go grab the key we want to evaluate in our where, where clause. And then apply our predicate, right? If key is greater than equal to low and key less than equal to high, then we're going to copy that tuple into our output buffer, increment our offset in the output buffer, so that if we come back around, you know, we can start the next tuple, right? So the 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 bad part of this about this query is obviously this if clause, because as I said, the unless the key is is you know going to be almost always the same value. Uh, then, then like, it c could be completely random whether I'm going to go down this path or not. And the, and the CPU is going to have a hard time actually predicting whether to do this or not. All right? And if I, you know, I could put likely or unlikely, but again, that's just a hint, and, it's, and it may not actually be representing what the actual data is. So this is how to do this scan using branching. We can rewrite it, though, to do a branchless scan where we're still going to iterate over every single tuple, but the very first thing we do is copy the tuple into the output buffer. We don't evaluate the keys. We just say, we just copy it. And then we have a little uh, two ternary operations here where we go do a comparison of the keys based on our where clause predicate. And what's happening is if the predicate matches, then we, we have a 1. If it doesn't match, we have a 0. And the two things together. And that then tells us whether it's a 1 or a 0. And based on that, that's going to tell us whether we increment our counter or not. So that if these both are therefore zero, then the offset will be zero. And when I loop back around, when I come back, I'm just right along what it should not be. And then I need some code down here to make sure that if the last one didn't match, that I don't include that in my offer, right? But for simplicity, I'm not showing that here. So what's going to happen is, even though these look like these conditionals, the I'm operating on integer directly, the compiler can then write the arithmetic operation. Right? It's more than the instructions say this back in this type, but we turn this into like key modulo. Check, check the actual bits themselves using uh, bit operators to see whether it's zero or not. Like, we can rewrite all of the more instructions to do just, just do the math to determine. Right? So this seems like this would be terrible, because for a billion tuples, I'm copying all one billion of them. And uh, in this case here, I'm only copying the ones that actually match. But again, depending on the selectivity of the predicate and what our data looks like, this actually might be the, the better approach. So this is a graph later from the vector and show a, a scan on a table with both the branching and the branchless version of that scan, as I showed before. And then the x-axis is varying the selectivity of that predicate. So over here, when the selectivity is low, meaning most tuples are not going to match, right, when, when no tuples match, the branching one actually performs the best. Because again, I'm, I checked my conditional, and uh, it doesn't match. So I'm not wasting instructions doing the copying. 
Furthermore, the CPU is going to predict like the last, you know, this almost every single tuple is never going to match that if clause. So it's going to predict to go around it and not do the copy as well. But up to around 5%, uh, then it actually starts doing worse than the branchless case. So the branchless one is a flat line because no matter what, what, whether the predicate values are true or not, I, I'm always paying that penalty to do the copying, right? So that's why it's, it's almost a plateau straight across. And as you can see up in here, when it's like 50% selectivity, 50% of the tuples are matching, 50% of them aren't matching. That's the worst case scenario because that's the CPU just can't predict this at all. And only when you get down here, when it's like 100 tuples matches, that does the CPU uh, catch up. Yes? But this graph will be very dependent on your memory latency, right? Because you have changed the bottleneck from your uh, like misdetections to your memory. Now your question is, is so you're saying this, uh, this graph will look different if you change the, the memory bandwidth speed? Or the, yes. Um, because the new bottleneck is now the memory. Well, I mean, like, the, okay. the memory of what? For memory the scan? Memory band. Like, yeah, so, 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 like, I have to do that scan for both cases. Right? Nobody it, have to copy in only one case. Yeah, but think about it, like, going back here. Like, I do this copy, right? If I come back around, if, if this does, if I do a copy, the tuple doesn't match. I come back around when I do the next copy, I'm overriding the last place I copied into memory, and that's going to be sitting in my CPU caches anyway. Yeah, but, like, there's always one transfer, right? Like, that is through memory only. Like, the transfer what? To do this copy? Yeah, you are transferring. This, this, this is going to be in CPU caches, right? I read the tuple, I've got to bring it to my cache, right? I've got to do that for, for both of them. Now I do this copy that's writing from one cache location to another cache location. Probably going to be an L1, right? If, I it's, I mean, it's, it, it's the next instruction after this. I bring the tuple in my cache, yeah. then I copy it, and that's running to another cache location. Then I loop back around, and the, the, yes, by the time I come, I do this and come back around, and I do another copy, it may be the case that, the, the, like, if I'm overwriting the last one I copied, that location got flushed in my CPU cache, maybe it gets flushed from L1, but I think it's unlikely to get flush from L2, L3. Right, this is a tight loop. There's nothing else we're doing. We're just evaluating this one predicate. There's no guarantee because we can't control how the, the caching policy of the CPU. Uh, x86. You can give it hints, but it doesn't, it's not required to follow it. Like, because the compiler does all the other things, like lining, loop and rolling, all of those things should also be in the power. Like, you write this code doesn't mean it will be executed like this in the CPU. Yeah, so his point, which I agree with him, is that uh, I don't know what other optimizations the CPU could be doing here, uh, or sorry, the compiler could be doing. Like, it could unroll the loop so it's like four copies and then a bunch of these things and come back around. Software pipelines. But, so again, so the, the, this is what systems research is, right? The, the, you have an exact view of And we see the result that our hypothesis. So the hypothesis is that when branching, uh, when most tuples don't match, the penalty of paying that copying is is not worth it because you're you're doing these extra instructions maybe you didn't, didn't need to, right? So I, I so I agree with you that there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of other things that could be happening here that the compiler could be doing. Uh, but we can at least like we can verify that this is actually working out correctly the way we think it is based on the, these these results. Yes. Um, so actually, I guess I have a question. So like this is mostly for like the case of like a table iteration. Does this significantly change the event we're doing? I mean, I imagine it does because if you're doing like an index iteration, like an index along like a like a leaf nodes of a, of a like a B plus string or something like that, because then you're not having all these adjacent tuples. Or... Yeah. So, so so his so his question is, this works fine if 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 you're doing a table scan because. You're just going to rip through contiguous regions of memory. The, the, there's a memory prefetcher that, if we knows we're accessing things that are sequential, it'll bring those things in to reach our cache meshes. So we get a lot of benefits from scanning columns. If it's an index scan, there's not much I can do as I probe down, other than maybe prefetching memory. Um, but once I get down the leaf nodes, and now I start scanning along the leaf nodes, am I going to get the same kind of benefit if I do something like this? For 
data in the same node, like if I'm evaluating tuples in the same node, and I don't have to go maybe look at the, at the, 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 the remaining parts of the tuple, like if, so if I have my key, my, my index is based on this key, uh, but then there's also another part uh, in the where clause that touches another attribute where I gotta then go look at the tuple, then this probably is a bad idea, or this probably was not gonna be as big of a win, but if I'm just looking at what I need exactly in that node, then, then th I think this would still work, yes. Um, for what clause? Um, likely and unlikely. Yes. Um, those special codes, if like uh, x86, they don't work anymore. Is it more for the compiler to like maybe move code into locations good for cache? Like your question is, if, if you use the likely, in this case here, so like if 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 our selectivity is fifty percent, so likely and unlikely doesn't help us here. Right. So in that case, could the compiler then? Rewrite the code, or do what, sorry? Um, no, I was saying that like, maybe likely and unlikely, the special OP codes there, they don't actually um, influence how the underlying hardware works. Yes. Like how underlying CPU works, but maybe the compiler can move the more likely uh, block into the, um, directly after the if statement, so that like... Um, oh, so it's, it's basically like, if I had if then else, then you're saying like, do I get any benefit from, say the else clause is the one that's most likely to happen, should I, should I flip them, right? Do whatever, the, 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 the Boolean logic to reverse this so that the, the, the first thing that comes out of the if clause is the likely one. I actually don't know what they do, yeah. Because then like, all your instructions will be in cache. Yeah, right, yeah, I see, I see your point, yeah, yeah. I, I actually don't know. Yeah. Actually, I mean, it's a good point. Actually, going back to like. Well, yes, applies to a statement to allow the compiler to optimize for the case where paths of execution, including a statement, are more likely, to, more likely than an alternative path of execution that does not include such a statement. Um, so, yeah, maybe, I mean, this is not very documented, but maybe this, maybe this is how they, this is what it's actually doing. Yeah, and like if you know which block you're going into, maybe that can help you like decide whether to inline the function or not because you know like. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So his point is, if you know whether you're going to go down one branch or not, you can then make a decision about whether inline or not. Yeah. I mean, compilers are a whole another beast. It's not. Yeah. We'll talk about. I'm obviously not a compiler expert. We'll talk about compilers in the context of databases next class, like the things that we. Know. That's a good point. Okay. So, um, the other thing we want to try to also avoid, which is the first problem we talked about of having a lot of instructions, uh, uh, you, you know, use more instructions maybe than we need necessary to do X-series. Again, if, the, if we design the system to be sort of general purpose, a lot of times what you'll see in, in these databases are these giant switch clauses that, that as you start evaluating predicates or evaluating tuples, for every single type of data your, your database can support, you have these which call, switch calls. Like, if I have an integer and I'm adding it with the integer, do this. If I'm adding it to a float and do that, all that adds branches, all that adds you know, misprediction that's going to slow us down. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's more instructions to actually you know, evaluate the, the conditionals and decide whether, what our type of data is. And so I didn't, we didn't show this example before, uh, but this was an in intro class. If you go look at the Postgres source code of how they handle numerics, like the fixed point decimals, this is just the function to do add, right? To add two numerics together. And you see there's all these if clauses, like if it's, if it's negative, it's positive, if, one, you know, if we're taking the absolute value of something, right? All this is problematic because this is a lot of instructions and a lot of chances for the, C the CPU to get this wrong. So we'll see this again on, on Monday next week of how to specialize our, our specialized code Four queries that you need for that one query. And this is called code generation or just in time compilation. All right, so now so we know how to, uh, we know what the CPU is going to look like, and we want to know how we want to design our operator implementations to uh, be mindful of it. Now we want to talk about how we're going to organize the system to process the queries, which can, are comprised of multiple operators. So the last class was talking about how we actually schedule the, the tasks that, are, that, that execute these operators. 
But now we're going to talk about a sort of a higher level concept. So there are going to be different trade-offs we're going to make depending on what type of workload we're going to want to, want to support, like OLTP transactions versus OLAP analytical queries. So this is the most common one, the general purpose one, the iterator model, materialization model, and the vectorized model. So again, the spoiler would be that the, in, in a modern analytical system, we're going to want to use the vectorized model because we can pass, col we can, we can pass uh, you know, chunks of columns between operators and then use SIMD instructions inside the operators to execute them uh, efficiently. This is something called the volcano model or the pipeline model. Volca volcano is a, uh, a inline system uh, that came out in like the late 1980s, early 1990s. In addition to defining the exchange operator, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, there's also the volcano query optimizer, uh, which we'll cover in a, in a, later in the semester, which then was the, the precursor to Cascades, which is another optimizer, optimization scheme I'll talk about. Like this, the, the, the Gertz Graffy was also the guy that, that did the, uh, the, that wrote the, the modern B, B plus G book that I sent to you guys for the first project. It's, the guy does amazing stuff. It's very influential. So in the iterator model, the way we're going to implement it is that every single operator is going to implement this, this next function. And what happened is when someone calls next on that operator, it has to then return back uh, one tuple. And, if it, and since we organized tree, that, that operator needs data from its children, it'll call next on its children. And that sort of cascades to the bottom where you have the access methods where, we, where you're retrieving the data from the table or an index, and then we, we move the tuples up, right? And essentially, just, we're going to keep calling next, 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 next at the, at the root and keep getting tuples and we get output for, for, you know, for our cursor until at some point we get, a, we get a response and say there's no more tuples available to us. So at a high level, it looks like this. So say we have a uh, two-way join on table R and S. And so for every single operator, we're going to have this little for loop that basically is going to iterate over some, some input data that it's getting, either from the table or from its children, and then emit them up. So again, think of these as just the next function. So when my child up here, the first at the root, we call next on our, on our child. We come down here to this next block, and it wants to do the join. So it's going to iterate over its left child come down here and say, give me, give me the next tuple you have, and this will send back up a single tuple. And we keep doing this until this is finished, till we get all the tuples and we build our hash table. Then we fall down to the next for loop, call next on this child, and then it's just the same thing. It starts moving tuples up to, from the S table, then do our probe in the hash table, and then anything that matches gets shoved up here. Right? So this approach is, yes, yeah, sorry. Like switch out and do something else in the meantime. You, so so my, let's say like R involves more processing than just like emitting tuples. Okay. And like you can't immediately get the next tuple. Yes. Would you, would you do something else in the meantime? Or would you just so, so we're not, we're, that's, we're not there yet. So this is like, that would be like, how do we, what are the CPUs doing when they're processing? Think of this as like, just for simplicity, think of one thread calls next on the root, that calls next on this child, right? And there's one instance that's iterating with this tuple. Right, so it's a blocking call. So when I call next, this is not processing, this is waiting. Okay. So this is used in almost every single database system you've ever heard about. Uh, the advantage of this is that we're going to be able to do pipelining, meaning like in this case here, for, as we emit a tuple at a press, ride that away all the way up for our, our queen because everything we need to, in order to process a single tuple is available to us at that point in time when, when, we're do, when we're calling next, right? I can take this tuple, show up here the predicate, put it up, probe, probe the hash table, and if that matches, then I show up here and do the projection. And then I can produce that tuple as my output. So that's considered a pipeline. The fact we can take one tuple and ride it all the way up into, uh, in this case here, the output of, of the query, or if there's a, a, a pipeline breaker where we can't go any farther, then it gets buffered up there. So, uh, right, so that's, that's what I was saying. So some operators are at the block until they get all their children emit all their tuples. Uh, and the other advantage you get from the iterator model is that output control is really easy because we don't have to push down any logic to do limits necessarily because if I know I only want to get 10 tuples as from, from my query, then I just call, I call, stop calling next on the root once I get 10 tuples. You know, I've seen everything. 
And so down here, this is just this is just a sample of the of the, the of the databases that use this approach. Like these are ones I, I can confirm by looking at the documentation or, or looking at the source code. But I'm sure that that's Uh, the iterator model. That's the canonical way. Yes. Do you know of anyone who's doing compilation? This is again. This is different than compilation. Mm -hmm. this, this, this is orthogonal. This is like you can still do compilation, right? I could still take all these for loops, pop that, and run it, and that would still be using the iterator model. Mm -hmm. In the case of hyper, they're doing. Uh, they're still doing this. I mean, that's another thing we need to talk about as well. Like. This is a this is a top down approach, meaning I start at the top and I sort of pull tuples up. The the reverse of this would be a push approach where you start at the bottom and you have this for loop and you start here rather than here and you start emitting tuples up. Hyper does that. Most systems do uh, the top down iterator model. That's the most common one. Yeah, that, that's next next class. Okay. okay. I realize it's like it's like kind of lame for me to give this lecture and like, oh yeah, yeah, here's something cool. Next class, right? It's like tables first, and then we'll get this stuff. All right. So the other one, the next one, the idea here is that rather than having a next call where it only gives back a single tuple, uh, I'm going to have every operator materialize all the tuples that is ever going to produce all at once. And then shove that to the my next operator. And again, I could be either doing this from the top down, like you call, you know, get next or next, and then instead of getting one tuple, you get a, you get get everything all at once. Or I could push it from the bottom up, like run the, run the operator, get the output, and then put it shove it up to the next guy. Right. So in the materialization model, you can either do materialize an entire row or a single column. Like if you're doing analytics, it doesn't make sense to materialize the entire. Uh, all the attributes of a tuple in your output buffer. If you know that you know most of the t most of the table most of the query is not going to need those columns at all, or all the rest of the query is not going to need those columns at all. Um, and so this is basically the same thing. You need to be a column store or or a row store and do this. So going back here, right, instead of having the next function, we just have this this, this in every single operator. Now we're going to allocate an output buffer, and then we just keep filling it up with tuples that match. And then when we're done, we we shove it up. So again, assume I come from the top down, I call the output function on this guy, he calls the output function on this guy, he puts all the tuples that he has in a buffer, puts it on this thing, now he can iterate over this, uh, this output buffer and, and build out his hash table. And then we do the same thing for this other one here, and we, and we shove data up. Right? So in this example here, this is, this is, I mean, this is like the, this is a naive implementation. This is obviously really stupid because for some of these things, I actually can combine together what the operator is actually doing. Right? So in this case here, what am I doing? I'm scanning the table S, putting all the tuples in table S into my output buffer, then passing that output buffer now to this operator, which is just going to iterate over that and evaluate my predicate. So a better idea was obviously just combine these two operators together. So I do that one scan, uh, as you just do scan the table, evaluate the predicate, and if I see the match, then I, I you know, put in my output buffer. Right, and you could do the branchless one or you could do the, the branching one. It depends on the implementation. So although this seems like, in my, again, the naive example, this seems really stupid. You wouldn't want to do this. Like, there are optimizations you can do to, to, to make this go faster. And you can do other things like if I, know I have a limit clause up above and I only want 10 tuples, I could push that down you know, as, as needed as well. All right. So it is my opinion that the materialization model is the best for, uh, for uh, OOTP workloads because these operators or these queries only want to touch a small number of tuples at a time. So the size of the output buffer that I'm shoving up to the next operator is not going to be that big. Go get Andy's account record you know, on his Amazon, you know, Amazon's website. That's one tuple that I may need to move from one operator to the next. Right? And we're going to get benefit from this as well because we call the operator once, right? We call that output function once. We get all the tuples we're ever going to need for the operator. We never go back to it again, and we shove the data along, and that reduces the number of function calls, which are going to, again are going to be expensive because those are jumps in our instruction stream that the CPU has to execute. So for OLT, I think this is this is the right way to go. 
And then when we built HDoor, which was then commercialized as VoltDB, this is how we, how we did it. MoonADB did this as well, although they're trying to do this for analytics. Uh, and so there was a bunch of papers that they had to come up with to actually overcome this issue of like trying to materialize all the data at once in, in memory. HiRISE originally did this as well. This is a German academic system. Uh, the old version did this approach. The new version does not. They rewrote it to do the vectorized model. And then surprisingly, I think this is true, uh, Teradata does the same thing. But they're like a massive scale uh, uh, you know, parallel data warehouse. So they're running OLAP queries. So they have a bunch of crap they have to do to do a bunch of pushdowns as much as possible and basically inlining operators within each other to avoid having to sh you know, move data in wholesale from one, you know, one node to the next. I need to double check this, but I'm pretty sure this is how it works as well. It's surprising because, you know, well, Teradata was designed in like 1979, so it was before the, sort of the vectorized model uh, came along. All right, so the last one again is this vectorized model. So this seems sort of obvious to us now, but like before the X100 paper from, from Peter Bonson and Marcin, Marcin, people just didn't build database systems this way. They either did the materialization model or the, or the, uh, the iterator model. So with the vectorized model, it's basically like the iterator where you have this next function, but obviously instead of sending, sending a single tuple, which would be expensive to do if we have to scan a lot of tuples all at once, we can send a batch of tuples. And the, the size of the batch is going to depend on what the hardware is going to look like, depending on like whether we can, the operator we're going to feed it into is going to be able to do vectorized execution right, on SIMDs. And so if we know the size of our SIMD registers, we can then make decisions on how big our, our, our batches should be. So going back to our example here, now slightly more complicated. We still have our next function. But now when we call next, instead of getting back a, uh, a single tuple, we're going to get back a, a batch of tuples. And then inside the, the kernel here, when we, when we do our for loop, we could do you know, uh, vectorize instructions to execute those things in, in parallel efficiently. Take that batch, apply all the predicates with a single SIMD instruction, something like that. And the same thing now for the other side. So this is ideal for OLAP queries, again, because we're reducing the number of invocations per operator. We're moving tuples around from one operator to the next in such a way that we can execute vectorized instructions very efficiently. Uh, most da analytical database systems built in the last 10 years uh, are going to follow, follow this approach. So SQL Server and DB2 and Oracle, if you just get the regular general purpose row store version of these database systems, it's all going to be using the iterator model. But then they have these specialized execution engines, like the fractured mirror stuff we talk, talked about for Oracle. Uh, uh, DB2 has this accelerator called Blue. Right? These are all sort of the, these standalone copies of data that, that have vectorized execution models, and they get better performance. CockroachDB is actually not an analytical, but surprisingly, they have a blog article that, that shows that they have a vectorized uh, uh, engine. Um, and then in our new system that we're working on here, it, everything's vectorized as well. Okay. Yes. Is the size of the vector aligned with the SIMD size, or is it better to do it larger than that? Question is: Is the size of the vector uh, aligned to the SIMD size? Um, in our system, it, it's aligned to the SIMD size, but it's not going to be exactly the, the SIMD register size. So, like, if your if your SIMD registers are 512, 512 bits, it's not like you want to pass around only five hundred twelve bits. You would pass around maybe like like 10 chunks that are each 5 and 12 bits. So they, they, you can take a chunk within that vector and then do the vectorized execution on it. Um, and typically the way that works is, and this is what we do in our system, when, it, when you turn on the database system, they go read information from, from, the, from the CPU, of like what are your SIMD register sizes, what are your cache sizes, and then you can make a decision how to, how to, how to, how to size things up that way. It's usually just heuristics. Okay, so I already said this before, right? There's, uh, I'm sh in all my examples I was showing top to bottom, uh, but you can actually go bottom to top, right? This one is the most common because this is people, you know, this is like the textbook implementation of, of how people build database systems. The paper you'll read for next week from Hyper shows that you actually want to use a bottom to top approach because now you can be very careful about how you organize the code to execute queries so that within your pipeline, you're not just writing up values from tuples within your CPU caches. They can go even more lower level and try to control things like so they remain in CPU registers. 
because that's going to be even faster than, 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 than the cache, L1 cache. In our old system, uh, which was then, we had this technique called relaxed operator fusion, which I'll cover uh, in, in later lectures, but this is actually now in our, our new system as well. Uh, the idea here is that we're trying to combine the, uh, the bottom to top approach with vector as execution, and, and we're trying to get the best, best of both worlds as hyper and vector wise. So we're trying to pass vectors and do bot bottom to top. And you need to be careful about where you sort of put your, your buffer boundaries so that you can stage things uh, in a certain size so that you can pass things along and that, that can fit in CPU registers, sort of what he was saying. Right? And it may not always be the pipeline breaker point. It may be points within, within a pipeline. And again, we'll cover that more uh, later on this semester. All right, so now let's talk about, regardless of whether we're doing uh, materialization, you know, what processing model we're using, we can talk about how we actually want to run parallel queries. So we've already talked about how to do inner query parallelism before. Right? That was the scheduling stuff we talked about last class, or we talked about. The idea here is just we want to allow multiple queries to run at the same time, and so you basically have a uh, you know a scheduling mechanism to decide you know what task or what query runs. Hyper originally just had it; you can only run one query at a time. When that query is done, then you switch to the next one. Uh, in the newer system, they don't do that. In most systems, you, you don't do that, right? Because you. You want to have the system be as responsible as possible. So sometimes you have like a fast, queue, fast query queue and a slow query queue. Uh, so there's different techniques. And then we use concurrent control to protect the, uh, the data if, if, if queries are updating things. So uh, this is a conjecture of mine. I can't prove it, but it's after I thought about it for a little bit. I don't think that there is any difference in, um, in the complexity of implementing a different pro query processing model. Uh, the complexity doesn't change if you're using different concurrent control schemes. Meaning, like, if I'm doing two-phase locking or OCC, it doesn't matter whether I'm using the materialization model or the, the, the vectorized model. I, all, I think they're, 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 they're isolated from, me, from each other enough that it doesn't actually really matter. Because in my access method, when I go back to tuple, that's when it goes and checks to see whether I can actually read something or not, or whether it's being held, you know, somebody else lock on it. And all that doesn't matter for, for this. All right, what we care about, though, though, is intra-query parallelism, and that's how we take a single query and now execute all its operators in parallel. Again, the scheduling stuff was last week. It's just how we assign these tasks to, to cores. Now it's, it's basically how do we then organize the flow of data within our query plan so that we, we can determine whether one task is allowed to run yet, uh, uh, run yet or not. So the two approaches to do parallelism or inter parallelism Meaning uh, we're going to have uh, different horizontally across the query plan. And at vertical parallelism, is I can have different parts of the query plan execute at the same time. And again, I need to be mindful about what data dependencies I have between these different tasks um, to determine whether I'm, I'm okay to do it. And again, although I'm laying out as these two different approaches, it's not like an either or. You can actually combine these, these two things together. So you can do parallelism and, and vertical parallelism together as within the same query. There will also be, uh, within every single operator, there will also be a parallel version that we can, we can use to execute the query, or execute that operator, and that's what we'll start covering uh, next week, or when we start talking about parallel joins and sorting. So we take our operators, uh, our operators then are instantiated into or as separate instances, and they're all both going to perform. All the instances of the operator are going to perform the same function, just on different pieces of data. This is the morsel stuff about last time. Break my table up into horizontal partitions, and then the different instances are going to run through different different partitions at the same time. So to coordinate now these different instances running at the same time, that is a basically like another way, a breakpoint in our query plan so that we can recognize that we can't proceed up into the query plan until all the operator instances below us produce all the, the tuples that, they, that they're supposed to produce. There's a way, again, for us to organize the query plan and keep track of internally whether, you know, whether one set of tasks of operator instances are allowed to run or not. So say we have a simple query, J on B. So we can take this scan on A and we can break that up into different operator instances. And each of these guys are going to run on, on a, in, in a separate worker. But then now, because I want to do, uh, I want to 
line the operators within my pipeline, I can also do the, the filter as well. So take the output of each of these scans and feed that immediately into this filter operator to then remove anything that shouldn't be there. But now also I can do other optimizations like if I have this projection up here that shows me that I only need the out, I only need the a, a dot id for my query and say this or for, say this table a has a thousand tuples. So rather than me copying a thousand tuples up from one operator to the next, I can actually push down now, make a copy of the projection here to filter out everything just the a, except for the aid I need here. So then now they're going to do the, for the join. They need to build the hash table. And I'm not declaring whether this hash table is uh, a single hash table or whether it's partitioned. It doesn't matter. But I know I can't now do anything on this side. I can't start scanning B and, and doing the probe in the hash table in, until the hash table is actually built. Otherwise, I, I could get false negatives. Right? I could do a lookup and say, does my hash table contain this key? It, it, it should, but I just haven't got through it yet. So I need to wait. And these are all done before proceeding with the next one. So this is what the exchange operator is doing for us. It's basically now a way to coalesce the results from running from these different tasks, uh, running on different workers, and keep track of, I can't proceed until this is done. And then now for, for this, on this side, right, I'm doing the scan on B, same thing, I also do the filter, do my push down, my projection. Now I probe my hash table in parallel, right? And each of these guys are gonna produce an output. But to make sure that I don't produce the final result of the query until they've all finished, I add another exchange operator up here that just knows that I'm waiting for three threads to give me all the results. And then once I have everything, then I can shove the output to, to, the, to up above. Right? So now my example here, I put the exchange operator uh, after we build the hash table. This is unavoidable. We definitely, we definitely need this. But I could have set the query up such that I have a... Um, I have an exchange operator here where I do the scan, do the filter, do the projection, and then all my, my, my uh, operator instance tasks start filling in an output buffer in this exchange operator. And then once they're all done and that's all done, then now I can blast, have the, theory, the queries uh, blast the, um, or do the join and produce results. So there's different alternatives to doing, executing this query. And again, it depends on what the is, depends on the selectivity of the predicates, depends on the selectivity of the join clause. The data system could try to figure out what the right way to do this is. Right, there's not one plan that works for everyone. All right, so now for inter-operator parallelism, the vertical parallelism, the idea here is that we can overlap now different operators running at the same time. We can still have to use an exchange operator to keep track of whether you know, a, operator instance, a, a, a set of operator instances have produced all the results they're supposed to produce. But instead of, you know, doing one and then, you know, a bunch of work and then switching over to the next one, I could have a thread start processing data as it arrives from, from the query plan below it uh, and do that in parallel, right? So this is also sometimes kind of pipeline parallel, meaning I'm running the pipelines in, in parallel. So say I'm doing a Cartesian product across four tables, right? Join A, B, and C, and D with no, no join clause, right? You wouldn't actually do this, but here it is, right? Uh, and so the query would look like this, where I can now run the on A and then B and do that in parallel, but since I know I can't do the, the remaining join on, uh, on the C and D output until, that, until this is all done, then I can put my exchange operator like this. So what will happen is I can have one thread do the join on A and B, fill up some output buffer here, right, and then, which would mean building out the hash table as well. Then another thing I can do the join on C and D, uh, but then once, and then as these guys are and then for the, producing the join result, I have this thing now, uh, I start running this time, right? Because in this case here, there's no where clause, there's no join uh, clause to determine whether something should match or not. So, I, I'm doing Cartesian product, so I want to take any tuple that comes out of C and D and match that with any tuple that matches with A and B. So I don't need to wait for these guys technically to finish. They can start shoving all the data out in parallel and have it, you know, start, start computing the rest of the join as well. Right? Okay. So to finish up real quickly, uh, the thing we didn't really talk about too is also like how to determine the number of workers we're going to use. We talked a little, a little bit about the last time. Um, 
of how, how we wanted to organize the, sort of the scheduling mechanism, but we never really decided, okay, well, I had this number of cores, how many, and this number of tasks, how many workers should I actually use? And as, as I already sort of alluded to, in that one example with the, uh, with the, 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 the horizontal parallelism, it depends on what the, the data looks like, what the, what, what the selectivity of the predicate is, and how much output data I'm going to generate. So one simple way to do this, is you, in, in the case of Hyper, you just have one worker per core, and you just pin them to the core that they're actually running. And then another approach is you have multiple workers per core, which is the HANA approach. Uh, and the idea here is that if one, one worker ever blocks, then we just you know, we let other cores run, run, threads run in the cores at the same time, right? Last thing to talk about, again, is, this, is, is I think we already covered this last class, actually, the push versus pull. Yeah, actually, we ignore this. This is just the sketching stuff. I don't know why this is here. Sorry. Um, this is just saying that, like, in the case of Hyper, I was pulling from a, uh, from, a, from a global queue, whereas in the case of HANA, I was pushing things into the queue, and then the threads had to take them, right? All right, so to finish up, so the... As I said today, and we'll see this more on Monday, the easiest way for us as humans to implement parts of our database system may turn out be the worst way for the CPU to actually execute this. And so if we're aware of what the hardware looks like, how it's going to behave, we may not know exactly how it's going to behave, but we can at least uh, be mindful of it a little bit. We can design the execution code for our database system to be, be optimal for what the, hardware, what the CPU actually wants. And then as we see in, the, in today and throughout the rest of the semester, the, it's my opinion that vectorized, the bottom-up execution approach will be the best way to always execute OLAP, OLAP queries. For OLTP, it'll be bottom-up materialization. But most systems, that, like a lot of systems, like you think like Postgres, MySQL, uh, uh, DB2, Oracle, all these are sort of designed to be general-purpose systems, and that's what the iterator model uh, tr uh, tries to be, like sort of good for everyone. Yes? How, how does it matter bottom-up or top-down? Why does it matter bottom-up versus top-down? fewer function calls, right? So like for bottom up in the materialization model, I, I call the operator, uh, the execution function for that operator. It runs, produces some output, take that output now, call the next function on, on the next and so forth, right? If you're going top down, it's like call this, call this, call this. I guess it's still, it's still the same. For materialization, it doesn't matter. For, uh, for vectorization, yes? So like what you could do is you have, uh, like you imagine like this being like co-generated or something like that for the bottom up, right? You say you call like the bottom function, like you'll leave node, right? You can't save that output, then you then pass that output into a next function. So it's like function, 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 instead of function that calls another function that calls another function that calls another function. So it's like recursive execution as opposed to like recursive. Yes, yeah, he's right. So it's, it's, it's iterative execution instead of recursive execution. Um, and then when you have, like, in the, in the, 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 as far as my understanding is, the best code you can have for a compiler, if it's just a bunch of uh, no conditionals, everything's just sort of one instruction after another. Because the, the, the compiler can look at that holistically and make better decisions. Okay? Smaller call stack. Uh, you, call the you have a smaller call stack as well, yes. Uh, that typically is not going to be an issue for query plans because it's like. But like, but like, but for like the call stack, you know, it's not. I mean, I. Yeah, like if it's, but I can't imagine it's going to be like a million function calls. Like, it, like if an operator is in a query plan, that's that's pretty unusual. I I, I can't think of an example like that. Um, it's not to say the query can't be big, but like the the. No one's doing one million table joints. I think the, the highest number I saw was from, uh, uh, I saw a talk from HANA people recently where th they had one query that was doing a join of 1,500 tables. It's a lot, but it's not a million. So it's, 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 I, I, it's not going to be, the call stack I don't think is going to be that big. All right, so again, I, I, I realize again, I keep saying, oh, we'll cover this on Monday, we'll cover this on Monday. So, the compilation stuff, the coaches stuff on Monday, uh, that is, is the paper I'm reading is from the hyper guy, and I'm saying guy singular, like Thomas Neumann. He wrote that system and wrote the paper by himself, which is crazy. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a bit dense because it shows like the level LLMR, which you don't need to fully understand, 
sometimes understand the whole idea of what they're doing, uh, how to organize the query plan in such a way that that's ideal for the compiler to then generate CPU efficient code uh, is what the, the, the main takeaway should be. Okay? Question, yes? Uh, a question about SIMD. Yes. So, like, it's a single instruction, multiple data points. Yes. Should those data points be contiguous in memory, or does it not matter? His question is should those data points be for SIMD instructions? Again, we'll cover SIMD in way more detail. We'll have to do two lectures on it. The question is for SIMD instructions, do the data points you want to put into the SIMD instruction, do, do they need to be contiguous? So the way it works is there's, 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 a, there's a vectorized register, and you have to do loads into that. The, the data you're loading in doesn't have to be all, you have to put it into continuous, in actually continuous memory and CPU cache, and then write that in. I don't think you can do like load multiple times from like different locations. So if now the data is in, in, in different locations in memory, you have to then copy it into a single location and then copy it in. But to think about it, if I'm trying to do a scan on a column and apply a predicate in, in the vectorized instruction, it will all be contiguous for me. Yes? Does the scatter gather CPU instruction for the vectorized like If they are like... Yes, yeah, so, so he says there's the scatter and gather CPU instruction for this. I don't... The, one of them is not really implemented hardware. I forget which one. I don't know. I think it's the gather. It might, like, as of like 2019, 2020, maybe it is. There was a period where like gather had to be implemented through multiple instructions. And it kind of did that for you. Yeah. We'll, we'll cover all that as well. Yes. Yes. Did you about shared scan? Is that just like the bottom layer then has the same two folds? Yeah, so, so I didn't talk about shared scans. So a shared scan is uh, if I have two queries show up at the exact same time, and they're both accessing the same table, it's, it's a bit more tricky in an in-memory system. This is why they want to cover it. Like, for a disk-based system, the most expensive thing is going fetching the page. So even if you and I are running at the same time, but we have completely different predicates, if we can share that disk I.O. to go fetch that in, and then we take a copy of the, of the table or the, of the block and do our predicates separately, then that's a huge win. For an in-memory system, I'll, I'll still get some benefit of maybe having the locality of bringing it into my CPU cache. Like, that'll still matter. Uh, but the overhead of coordinating the, um, the different predicates at the same time, I think, is, is, is tricky. Like, sometimes you, you can do things like, I think the HANA guys do something like this. Like, if my, if my query is like, where, uh, where A, equals, A equals 1, and your query is where A equals 2, they will then convert that to where A in 1, 2, and apply that predicate at once, and then the output of that, we, we both get. And then we both have to then apply our additional predicate to get what we really want. So there's tricks like that you can do. I, I, I don't think it's that common for in-memory systems because uh, it really requires almost like pinpoint precision of the query showing up at the exact same time that can do this. In a disk-based system, I can piggyback off like, oh, I'm reading these blocks. Let me just co you know, come in where you started. Right? For in-memory systems, I don't know if anybody actually does this. Yeah, but that's the general idea. T like, it's, it's, like, like a limit clause or something, and it says like take a hundred tuples from a table or something like that. I have a hundred of those tuples already in my buffer pool. I can just grab a page out of the buffer pool. Yeah. So his question is: so in a disk-based system, for scan sharing, or, or, or one technique to do is, if, if I need to do a scan on the table, but I, I have a limit clause, so I only need, you know, maybe ten tuples, rather than just opening up a cursor or in scanning the the table, can I go peek in my buffer pool? figure out what I already have from that table. And if I have enough tuples, then I just process based on that. I don't think anybody actually does that. I think everyone always just does the scan because if it's already in your buffer pool, when you go do the lookup on that page, you'll get a hit in the buffer pool. Yeah. I don't think anybody actually does what you're proposing. We should do that for maybe for a project in the intro class. Um, the, the other more common thing, though, would, would be the covering queries for, for indexes, where if I have all the attributes I need to process the query in the index itself, uh, it's, I mean, that's not really scan sharing. That's, it's just avoiding having to go look at, look at, look at the actual scan on, on the table. So that's, that's probably the more common one. I don't know if anybody like peeking into the buffer pool and see what's around there and, and see if there's enough for me. Because right? um, you need to maintain some heuristics to say, like, I mean, think about what you're doing. right? It, 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 it's a needle in the haystack search. So, 
my, my query shows up, it's on table A, but most of the queries are on table B. So every single time I go look at my buffer pool, and I'm only gonna see pages from B, then I'm just wasting time. I might as well just go scan A. So you'd have to maintain some heuristics and maintain some kind of quick lookup to say like, oh, if you're looking for table A, like go, you know, find some stuff, you know, you'll find some stuff in the buffer pool with this probability. I don't think anybody does that. And I don't know if there'll be enough queries actually to, to, to want to do that, right? For OOTP, go get Andy's record. I'm going to follow the index. It's going to take me to the, the page I want to get, and I fetch that in. For OLAP, it's usually like scan the entire table. Uh, things with limit clauses would be like, think of like loading a, a web page of like, of like, like Hacker News. You see the, the top 10 posts, whatever, the, the most recent 10 posts. There's a limit clause to make that work, right? But it's sorting based on the, on the, um, on the timestamp. And those tuples may or may not be all on the same page. So I, I, it's, it's an interesting idea, but I don't, I don't think it's actually, I don't think enough queries to actually make, make that actually worthwhile. In the overhead of doing it, it would be too high. Yeah, this is a good thought experiment though. Anything else? Any other random queries about databases? Cool, awesome guys, all right. Um, yeah, Monday's class will be, will be uh, 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 compilation and then get started on, the, on the, the second project as soon as possible. And then we will, uh, we will announce what, what machine you should test your concurrency stuff on, okay? So his question earlier to the beginning, beginning of the class was, the first checkpoint, we will not check for concurrency. We'll only check for correctness. So if you wanted to, you could put a giant latch on the top of the thing uh, and just prove that you, you can do inserts and, and, and lookups correct, correctly, okay? Because again, Grayscope only gives us a single thread, so we really can't hammer it too much. All right? All right, guys, see ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit, because I ain't with that beer called the OE, because I'm OG Ice Cube, down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on, because I needed just a little more kick. Hook like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. Eight ball just dropped off, because ain't eyes hopped off, and my hood won't be the same. After Ice Cube, Say I to the brain. Yeah.